Oh my goodness. Hi. Welcome everybody. This is Jennifer Griffith at NAMOA and I've uh, been experiencing a few technical difficulties with <laughs> my um, my uh, connection here at home. So um, I'm not starting the normal way, which would be to show the NAMOA website so people can get a chance to um, see what, um, what NAMOA <clears throat> is which is the Northeast Waste Management Official Association. We are the six New England states, New York and New Jersey, the waste programs, which include the solid waste, the hazardous waste, the waste site cleanup, and the pollution prevention programs in those states. Uh, we the waste site cleanup programs, the priority is to um, focus on training and obviously PFAS has been a big focus of uh, the MOA efforts over the course of the last four years. And this webinar today is part of our uh, training and information sharing efforts. So uh, we've got the Northeast states on the, on the um, webinar, but also states and, and folks from all across the country. So welcome, and um, we will be posting the uh, PDF of the presentations from the webinar on the NAMO website. Normally I would show you <laughs> where that would be, but I'm afraid to give control back to myself because I might not be able to um, keep the connection and keep this going. So um, we're going to uh, start the um, webinar today uh, with Chuck Newell. Uh, what we're going to do is, um, is I'm going to try, hopefully, have my connection and keep able to uh, monitor questions that people type in. So we're going to try to go through, we've got four presenters today. We're going to go through uh, each presenter and I'm going to try to monitor the questions and hope, uh, and in case there's some fundamental thing that people don't understand, I will not be in which case I would butt in, but otherwise we will hold all the questions until the end, until that all four presenters have had a chance to go, just to make sure we can get through all the content. And then we will ask questions at the end, and I will read them uh, from what gets typed in, and maybe the presenters can also serve as a backup if somehow or another I disappear here. But um, I'm on the cell phone, with this, this connection, so I should be able to keep listening. I just might not be able to have all the internet things keep working. But um, so people can type in questions at any point, but we are going to try to hold questions till the very end. So I hope that makes sense. And I'm sorry again for myself having technical difficulties here at home. Um, but we'll get started here. So our first presenter is uh, Dr. Charles Newell. He is a vice president of GSI Environmental, and he's based in Houston, Texas. He's a member of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers, a National Groundwater Association certified groundwater professional, and an adjunct professor at Rice University. He was awarded ITRC's Environmental Excellence Award in 2016, and in 2020, he was awarded the Foundation Achievement Award presented by the Association for Environmental health and science. So with that, I will turn it over to Chuck. Okay. Well, thanks, Jennifer. And so today, of course, uh, uh, Steve, Dora, and uh, Kent and I are going to talk about remediation of PFAS sites. And to me, maybe that's represented by this, this image above, which is a 3D representation of a PFAS plume at a military installation. And, um, and, and what this, uh, what we're going to focus on, the four of us are going to take different perspectives of this problem, sort of like looking different parts of an elephant uh, um, in terms of what, what, what uh, we're going to do. Now, my perspective is going to be high up, sort of a high level look at PFAS compared to other groundwater contaminants. What can we learn from what we've done before? And really, how big is this problem compared to some of these other contaminants? Okay, so let's go on to the, uh, the next slide as we're going to go... Um, 
um, basically to the uh, sort of a, a background um, information about this this uh, this question about how big is the PFAS problem. Here is something from the PFAS Expert Symposium held last year, and this was where a group of people got together in Washington D.C. Adora was in this group, and then that later wrote a paper and talked about regulatory policy, chemistry and analytics, toxicology, bait and transport, remediation. And here's one key thing that really made, was interesting to me, that the consensus message from the symposium participants is that PFAS present far more complex challenges to the environmental community, that's us, than prior contaminants. And so this really sparked a lot of light bulbs in my head uh, in terms of just how big is this problem? How is it different? How is it similar? And so one of the light bulbs that came off is I remember I gave a, a talk at, um, new, at the uh, REMTAC conference a while back and talked about a hypothesis that our business is really fueled by successive waves of emerging contaminants. And if you look at really long time, and this is over decades on the x-axis, remediation market on the y-axis is maybe number of sites or number of people working or, or the amount of money spent on remediation. You might look think waves, and maybe the first one was cleaning up of UST sites, gas station sites. And you made, well, there was a wave, it came up, then it came back down. Then another wave, maybe chlorinated solvents, and this this came up. Maybe it's a bigger wave than before. Did more difficult problem than waves like MTBE, waves like 1,4-dioxane. But the question really is, is how about PFAS? What kind of wave is it? Is is this going to be an issue that's that's relatively small and it's going to peak out, or is it going to just get bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually dwarf some of these others? Just what's the magnitude of it? Okay, well, a little bit about uh, this topic, PFAS, just one slide per perfluorinated uh, alkyl substances. We've got two of the big dogs here. We've got PFOA on the left, uh, carboxylate. We've got PFOS on the right. And what are the remediation challenges? Uh, well, there's a lot. They're, they're recalcitrant, that carbon fluorine bond, very hard to break. They're stable. They don't do this, they're, they're incomplete mineralization. They don't go all the way to CO2. Some of them are very highly mobile. They're complicated mixtures. You have this potential for these big and large dilute plumes. Sampling analysis is difficult and costly. So a lot of things are saying, hey, this is this is potentially a big problem. And so some colleagues at GSI and then Hans Stroh of Stroh Consulting, we said, let's go ahead and investigate this both qualitatively and quantitatively. And this is this paper we wrote, just came out. It's open access, so you can download it. Just Google remediation, PFAS, implications, comparing, and then you'll you'll get to this thing. But my co uh, colleagues, uh, Dave Adamson, Puno Kokarni, Blossom Ziribi, we all got together and said, what can we do to investigate and compare PFAS to these other contaminants and what does it tell us? So basically we start out, we're gonna do five qualitative analogs to things that happen with other contaminants regarding source zones, analytical developments, attenuation, mixtures, and plume lengths. And then we have nine quantitative scale of remediation metrics. We're gonna throw some numbers in these things, and but nine different metrics we're gonna look at and just see where we get to answer this question, sort of how does PFAS remediation compare to these other more com common contaminants? Let's do the five qualitative ones first. And so here, source processes. Now we're beginning to understand that at PFAS sites, that we have these uh, uh, these plumes, these PFAA plumes, these uh, these um, these uh, acids. They're sustained by things um, like storage of these compounds and the air water interfaces in these source zones. Then biodegradation of precursors. These precursors will generate this stuff, sort of like dissolution of a apple, and then matrix diffusion. But then if you go in the past, we sort of dealt with these source terms, I mean, fuels and chlorinated solvent plumes, dealing with things like NAPL matrix diffusion. So one similarity there. Let's go to, to qualitative analog number two. <clears throat> and that's how these analytical developments drive this, this whole problem. The PFAS, is we start getting better and better analyticals. These, these quantitation limits go down to the part per trillion level. And we see it in polar bears, we see it in surface water, and we start seeing it in groundwater and realize sort of this, this emerging iceberg of this problem. And the exact same analog happened in the 1960s, 1970s with GCMS coming online and people then at that time getting down to part per billion concentrations. And we got, got to see the scale of this VOC problem. 
Next, viability of M&A. The current thinking is that, you know, that maybe PFAS plumes are going to be hard to apply M&A to because they just don't degrade. And so can you do M&A for a non-degrading compound? And, and then the answer is yes. If we go back in time and we, we look at over, over the history of our business, there's extensive guidance from US EPA about doing monitored natural attenuation for metals and radionuclide, things that definitely don't degrade. Um, and the key there is that they're thinking about sequestration as the key attenuation process. So potential analog for us, because our PFAS plumes don't completely degrade all the way to carbon dioxide. Next, let's look at assessing risk for mixtures, PFAS, this complicated soup, all these different compounds. You've got this whole organizational structure, a lot of different properties. How do you deal with assessing risk for something like that? Well, going back in time in the hydrocarbon world, a mixture of all these different chemicals that these fuels um, team that people got together and did TPH criteria working group, TPH, total petroleum hydrocarbons. And they said, we're gonna look at the risk of these hydrocarbon mixtures with uh, 13 buckets with surrogate compounds and do that. So, so one way that our industry sort of handled this risk for mixtures business, just one potential analog. And finally, early forecasts of maximum plume lengths. Right now, these terminal PA FAAs, these, these compounds that, that have stopped uh, their degradation um, and, and they've got the, basically, they, they don't degrade any farther. The thinking is these plumes are gonna get really, really long and they're, many of them are long right now. But then just going back in time in the history of this, we think about just even hydrocarbon plumes, chlorethene plumes, MTB, 1,4-doxane, Originally, we thought, hey, these things don't degrade very much or they don't attenuate very much. And it turns out that they didn't get as long as we thought. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen in the PFAS world, but there is this sort of in the past, we were, we were pleasantly surprised that the attenuation was stronger than we thought. That may or may not happen with our, with our, uh, um, in the PFAS world. Okay, so that's our qualitative ones. But then if you're a nerd in here like me, you think, well, this is good, but hey, I wanna put some numbers to this. And so the team here on this paper, we got together and says, let's, let's actually try to do some quantitative numbers and do this comparison. And we'll see, see sort of how does PFAS world compare to TCE world? How does it compare to dioxane world? So we have these four different buckets, prevalence, fate and transport, remediation, research, nine quantitative scale of and metrics. And we're going to look at these and sort of um, uh, see what happens. So I've got nine different screens. And the first one, we're going to do this comparison. These are the prevalence metrics. How much is out there? Let's look at total production during periods with higher release potential. So for solvents, we sort of stop it when RECRA starts first getting on because the number of releases go way, way down once RECRA is in place. But then we can look at uh, the actual metric tons of the stuff that was produced in the United States. A lot of these are estimates. But like, for example, here's how much dioxane, about um, 200,000 um, uh, metric tons. Notice this is a log scale. The chlorinated solvents is a lot more. We're looking at you know 20 million metric tons. Here's uh, MTB, here's benzene. And so now if you look at this, this is four orders of magnitude going across here. Where do you think PFAS is going to be? How much of that did they produce compared to these other chemicals? Well, we tried to do the research, looked in these papers, Wang, and it shows up in here. So for the first metric, it says, on if you look at the top here, maybe this is a potential for smaller scale of groundwater mediation than these other ones, okay? Now that's the one of eight. Uh, maybe it's gonna change, but let's see what happens. Number two, estimated number of groundwater sites. And we look here, we've got the um, doxane, there's the chlorinated, there are these guys. And then for PFAS, we're using this estimable, this great research from a, a estimate from the Environmental Business Journal that says right in here, that's sort of in this middle range of this between smaller scale for groundwater remediation nationwide and larger scale for this. So that's metric number two, sort of in the middle here in terms of these estimates or you know, um, guesses on how many PFAS sites there ultimately may be. How about frequency of detection public groundwater water supply systems? This is percent of, of water supply systems, uh, uh, public water supply systems that are fed by groundwater. Here's benzene, TCE. PCE is the worst at about 18%. Geez, you'd think PFAS must be pretty bad because it, 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 it doesn't degrade. And so this stuff, these plumes must be showing up in these systems. So using looking at UCMR data, what do we get? 
I was shocked. It's really low. It's it's one percent. So this is just one of the surprising things when you start digging the data, you know, surprise me in terms of this. And this would say maybe it's potential for smaller scale. Okay, let's keep going. Um, next, we're gonna go to the fate and transport metrics. And let's look at medium plume length for multiple site studies. And this one isn't perfect because as I'll tell you, I'm using a proxy for PFAS, but let's look at MTBE. These are from plumathon studies, looking at multiple site studies. How long do they typically get? Maybe a hundred feet for MTBE, benzene 200 feet these uh doxane chlorinethines you know maybe about a thousand feet so there isn't this database of these plume lengths for pfas sites too early in the business so what i did is i'm going to use a proxy i'm going to use chloride sites because that's non-degrading and some of those chloride source zones are real high concentration and this is what we get um roughly about the same order of length not perfect this could be this could change but for this proxy says yeah it's on the high side but not that different than the other ones hydrophobic sorption here's doxane mtb no it's sort of much at all we got a little bit for tce and then two numbers here's pfoa here's pfos very different now, this is really complicated sorption there's a lot more going on than just this linear hydrophobic sorption so this is only telling part of the story but just taking numbers from uh, that, that's out there in terms of this this one type of sorption that may affect it. There's this wide range in PFOS, particularly in, in terms of these numbers. Says yeah, maybe it's it's not going to stick around. Some sites don't show this pattern at all. So, uh, but anyway, one metric that we've got based on available data. Regulatory criteria. Ah, you're thinking this is the big one. Now this is a reverse axis, okay, and it's going from 100 micrograms per liter to 0.01. We all know that these PFAS numbers, these cleanup levels, these action levels are really low, but but let's look at these others. And here's MTB. Hey, there's that five parts per billion for a lot of these guys. One for is even more stringent. Uh, where did PFAS? It's going to be way on the right. It's There's the 70 part per trillion for US EPA, a New Jersey proposed amount. So this is saying, yeah, based on these, these, these regulatory criteria, potential for much larger groundwater remediation nationwide. How about Let's go into remediation. And then so here is we've got this required destruction removal efficiency. And all this is, I'm gonna look at multiple site studies and take the median source zone concentration from a bunch of MTB sites, from a bunch of uh, benzene sites, TC sites, and divide it by the regulatory criteria and try to do the same thing for PFAS. So this is how far you got to go. It's not just the regulatory criteria, but it's where these average source zones are starting out. And so here's MTB, there's uh, there's um, um, TC benzene. Um, TC, it's got two different numbers, two different databases, show some pretty different results. GeoTracker is all the TC sites that were in California, TCE remediation. These are ones that actually did in situ remediation. But then where is uh, where's PFAS going to show up? Pretty low regulatory criteria, but maybe those concentrations aren't that low. Here's from two data sets, a Michigan data set we compiled. And it had pretty low source concentration. So this, you only have to go a factor of 10 to get to this cleanup level. This Air Force database was a little higher. It's um, 1,600 sites, uh, but it said maybe there's, you have to go down by about a factor of 80. But even though this PFAS says not as difficult to remediate just based on concentrations in terms of how far you reduction you need to get to your regulatory criteria compared to doxane and, and this one TC remediation site. So, so just some different perspectives on the, this potential metric about how far do you have to go to reach your, your regulatory criteria. Now, how well do these institute technologies really work? And this is the order of magnitude reduction. Order of magnitude is 90% is one order of magnitude. Um, so this is about a 90% order of magnitude at the 1.0 between what actually happened at remediation sites to what uh, before and after. And then for TCE, it's about one order of magnitude from this 235 state database we looked at. Benzene, we had 60 sites and it was it was about 0.5 orders of magnitude. Um, so how about, how about uh, PFAS? We just say there's nothing out there right now where we can get any sort of institute remediation. We're gonna say at zero for this, this study right in here. Last one is research intensity. And here I'm going to Google Scholar and I'm asking the Google, I'm saying, hey, how many papers um, were written with that keywords of TCE and groundwater over time? And then how many papers had either uh, groundwater in the words PFOA or PFOS over time? 
So first, let's just do, I just did it for TCE. It peaked about 420. And now, what do you think PFAS is going to be? About the same, you think? No, it's all up there. Just a lot more research. And part of it, there's more research going on. And I think this is the actual graph that you see on the bottom here. This is number of citations per year. This is the years down below. The blue bars show the TCE papers that were written, peaked in uh, <clears throat> 2012. And the red ones are just they're just going up, up, up. So we're seeing this just tremendous interest in it. So definitely this this would say it, it's such a big problem and there's more investments going into research. Hey, that's a potential sort of an indirect measure that a larger scale for groundwater remediation. Okay, implications. I got I think two slides left. We're just gonna wrap up and let's look at them all in one place and sort of see what we can figure out. So here's the big reveal, all the different ones together. And what we said in the paper, there are mixed results. You know, some of these show that that uh, the the PFAS sort of issue is going to be a pretty big deal compared to these other contaminants. Other ones say maybe it's going to be smaller, and that's sort of where we left it in the paper. But just some, you were, you know, in this talk in here, we've all been cooped up inside. You know, the brain says, uh, let me actually try to be a little more quantitative about this. So, okay, we'll draw this line in the sand. And I'm gonna count the red dots that are sort of on the um, scientific word, the worser side, the, the, the more the, the, where the potential for larger scale of groundwater remediation is. And I'm gonna start counting red dots. <clears throat> Total production, zero. No, not much was produced. Total number of groundwater sites, just a little bit over the, the, the one. So I'm gonna give it one point. I'm just trying to be fair here. Frequency detected in public water, water supply system, zero. The plume length, that's a one. Hydrophobic sorptions, well, I got two. I'm going to give it a 0.5. One point for regulatory criteria, well deserved. Re required destruction will efficient, zero. Relative in situ remediation capacity, that's a one. Research intensity, one. And overall, I get 5.5 out of nine. That says this is a big, pretty big deal. For example, the TC only has four uh, on the right hand side, the green chlorinated solvent. So I say, yeah, so this is this is sort of a big deal. Um, um, it may be as big or even bigger than maybe the chlorinated solvent world. So maybe that's one sort of just sort of semi-empirical method, say, that, um, yeah, there's a lot going on here because of these factors. Some of it's surprising, but overall, yeah, it's definitely a big problem. But then we talked about in our paper about, you know, how in the past we, we invented some great stuff to, to really uh, treat uh, hydrocarbon sites, treat everything else. And then this is where we ended up and that we say, although the problem of PFAS and groundwater appears to be a daunting one, we feel confident that a similar level of ingenuity that was things that were invented and developed for previous contaminants will lead to surprising technical developments in remediation PFAS in the future as well. And we're gonna see maybe some of these coming up uh, just in the next couple of uh, uh, speakers um, overall, but that's all I have. And so, for now, I think what I'm going to do is now let's get actually more into the detail. And then Dora is going to sort of look at it from treating the PFAS, I think, from the surface. And we're going to switch it over and hand it over to Dora. And um, and she is going to, let's see if I can do this. And Dora, you're on, I think. <laughs> okay. Thank so you. This is Jennifer at Namoa, and I'll just introduce Dora. And yes, I'm still having technical difficulties with my internet connection at home hosting this webinar, but we're almost at two o'clock. So if it does cut off after 60 minutes of my being disconnected, it should last till the end. So hopefully um, everybody will be okay. So again, this is Jennifer at Namoa, and I'm going to introduce the next presenter, which is Dr. Dora Chang. She's the Emerging Contaminants and PFAS Practice Leader at CBM Smith, and she's based in, I believe, their Atlanta office, correct? Correct, Jennifer. Okay, and she works on PFAS characterization, forensics, treatment, destruction technology development, and conceptual site model development, where she's uh, since 2012. She provides PFAS consulting to all types of clients, including drinking water, wastewater, landfills, and contaminated sites. She is also the ITRC PFAS training subgroup leader and a member of the PFAS treatment subgroup. So with that, take it away, Dora. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Charles, for a wonderful presentation. So I'm going to specifically now focusing on the PFAS treatment technology, and hopefully this will bring a lead way to introduce the other two speakers, Ken and Steve. 
All right, so what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start talking about the proven separation technologies. Right now, I'm more focusing on uh, drinking water treatment. And then I will start to step back and look into our overall PFAS cycle and what are the opportunities that we can break down that PFAS cycles. And then that will lead into the emerging technology development and I will conclude with a summary. So uh, probably most of us familiar with PFAS have heard about three major treatment technology. Right now, most of them being demonstrated for drinking water treatment purposes. They are granular activated carbon, anion exchange resin, and membrane. So like I said, those three technology has somehow more or less demonstrated more for the drinking water and groundwater treatment. But we do have to keep in mind, um, there are a lot of um, a, a water medias, um, they do have more complex matrices, uh, have more co-contaminants co comparing to drinking water and groundwater. And right now we do not have very good technology to address them yet. So that is why today we also want to focus on emerging technology development. So where we are in terms of just looking to drinking water treatment solutions. For those three technology in the past five to seven years, we have learned every single day in terms of how to really achieve an extremely low parts per trillion goal for protecting the drinking water. So we started with um, engineering engineering evaluation. Uh, for engineering evaluation, typically we help our clients look into the system upgrades meaning they already have some system, they want to know if their existing system can address PFAS, and if not, how can we upgrade it? And sometimes we do need to install some brand new system to remove PFAS only, and what kind of treatment option they can have. So the moving down the bench scale testing, they will allow you in a very short period of time to examine different kinds of products, different kind of um, a breakthrough from uh, the PFAS compounds in the drinking water. So that will kind of help you to optimize what your uh, full-scale treatment can look like. Some of the projects do involve pilot testing that will bring in on-site and look in the real water, how they're actually going to perform, what kind of issues we may encounter um, once we scale it up. During that process, we all now kind of get into the life cycle assessment. We know how to do it now. Um, that kind of a life cycle assessment probably do not exist five or seven years ago. We even move into a full scale demonstration, full scale uh, design and construction as well as operations now. So there are a lot of changes in the past few years. Every day we all learn very quickly. So just for the benefit of today's presentation, I'm going to quickly overview the top two technology that have been most frequently people talk about or even implemented uh, at, at the drinking water treatment systems. So you can see on the left-hand side is a granular activity carbon. The right-hand side is single-use anion exchange resin. Anion exchange resin really means it does only exchange with PFAS with anions. If the PFAS does carry, carry positive charges, a positive charges, it does not going to be effective. So let's focus on the right hand side first. For the single use anion exchange resin, we typically talk about two to three minutes empty back contact time. Comparing to GAC seven to 20 minutes, it's definitely much shorter. What that really means is you can actually design a system with a small infrastructure footprint. And the advantage of a short empty bed contact time is it does also have a longer bed life uh, for the uh, treatment vessels. Uh, because of the features of anion exchange reason, it does address both hydrophobic tail of the PFAS as well as the uh, functional group, either capacity or softness as the head of the PFAS structure. So it does cover, uh, cover a wider range of PFAS compounds in that way. Backwash is not needed uh, or not recommended, so you actually can't remove one of the potential um, uh, wastewater stream uh, backwash through the media. Um, and I'll change it, however, is also more expensive if you look at the per pound basis comparing to granular activated carbon. And also, NR exchange rate is not as extensively practiced as granular activated carbon. So you put those two technologies together, there are pros and cons, the facility may choose one 
technology over the another. Sometimes they couple both technology together. They may address higher concentration using gap and polishing with an iron exchange resin. They are all okay. Sometimes you have a two facility uh, for your treatment plants. One go with gap, one go with an iron exchange resin. There are multiple different options you can take. But regardless, there's one issue with the separation technology is they do generate spam media. You have to think about the offsite waste management. With that, here is just talking about gig and iron change reason. This is a quick overview based on the bench scale testing, uh, looking into different type of products. Uh, you can see on the top two graphic that shows the coal-based uh, granular activity carbon as well as coconut-based uh, granular activity carbon. And the button two are uh, NI exchange reason one as well as NI, uh, NI exchange reason two. And you see the dash black line on each chart. The left hand side of that blue dash line representing uh, peripheral alkyl sulfonates. Uh, the right hand side represents peripheral alkyl carboxylates. So looking at those four diagrams, you can quickly realize that sulfonate do have a much better sorption compared to carboxylate. And the charts, the, all the bar charts you see here representing the breakthrough of the compounds. So looking at those two, uh, those two diagrams on the top, you can see that either coal or coconut-based granular activated carbon are not doing a very good job in terms of removing C4 and C5 or even C6 carboxylates, which is well known. Uh, shorter chain compounds will break through granular activated carbon. Uh, it doesn't really mean that you cannot design a granular activated carbon system for your water treatment system. It just need to uh, pay a little bit of attention and also probably need a larger vessels to uh, overcome uh, this short chain breakthrough issues. When you look into the bottom two, the reason one was not designed for PFAS treatment. You can see the breakthroughs of C4 all the way to C8. And then comparing to the reason it was designed for PFAS, it shows much better improvement uh, performance as well, um, except the removal of C4 compounds. So they kind of give you some kind of overview in terms of the performance of a gap versus ion change resin. Like I say, you do can design your treatment system to start with gap and polishing with an ion change resin. But regardless which way you decide, um, the C4 compound is always very problematic. So this is the kind of a slide show you uh, from the bench scale study all the way that to scale up systems. Um, there are a lot of uh, consulting company now kind of uh, getting building our, our experience to design and construct a large treatment system. So this one is um, designed for Massachusetts. And now this is a slide. Uh, I talk about those three major technologies, right? Granular activated carbon, NI change resin, and reverse osmosis. Let's look at the pilot study. They directly compare one to each other. So you don't typically will see a lot of pilot testing comparing three different technologies at the same time. So this is a great um, example. Uh, we actually pass through the water and through these three different technologies. You can see the blue bar. The blue bar represents the intake, the PFAS concentration in the inferent. The green bar represents the filter efferent, meaning it passed through the powder activated carbon and being it detected at uh, 1.5 months after pilot study versus 5.5 months after the pilot study. Then you have some other bar charts representing ion exchange resin or granular activated carbon. You do recognize that uh, with all the colorful bar bars on those charts, uh, you do not see the yellow bars being showing up. The yellow bar represents reverse osmosis. Apparently, reverse osmosis is able to uh, remove the PFAS very efficiently, um, even after 5.5 months of pilot testing. Um, that is why we have found, and then repeatedly uh, we learned the lessons, um, the reverse osmosis is able to remove shorter chain compounds all the way to the long chain compounds. And I forgot to mention that this slide only show the shorter chain compounds. And longer chain compounds, we all know, either GIAN change resin or reverse osmosis can remove very perfectly. So this one focuses on the short chain compounds. So, Based on our understanding of using uh, reverse osmosis to remove short to long chain compounds, there are a lot of people question 
and um, wondering how reverse osmosis will be applied and how it can be applied, can it be applied? Because reverse osmosis does generate the reject. How do you manage that reject? What does that reject will eventually go? So this is a case study uh, in North Carolina. Um, this one already gone through the full scale design and just recently got the NTDES DES permit. And um, we are uh, the, the system going to be constructed uh, in the next three years. So this case is very unique uh, because you can see on this slide shows a good numbers of emerging contaminants range from PFAS, including GenX, um, intermediate PFAS, GenX manufacturing intermediates, one for dioxin, pharmaceutical, EDCs, pesticides, herbicides, based on the bench and pilot testing, apparently P uh, reverse osmosis is the most cost-effective way to remove all those emerging contaminants in one process. So this is why it decided uh, to go with reverse osmosis. But once again, if there's no way you can manage a reject, uh, reverse osmosis is not necessarily the best solution for your facility. So now let's look into the waste stream management. This is the last slide before I move into emerging contaminant, em emerging technologies. So looking into the GAG, uh, typically span GAG, we will not recommend to use uh, regeneration process to deal with span GAG. It has to go into reactivations. So during that reactivation process, some PFAS will be destroyed, and if there's any off gas, it will be collected. So the anion change reason, they are actually on the slide, I include both a single use and regenerable ion change reason. Single use ion change reason, once it being spent, was sent to the high temperature incinerator to destroy the resin and the GAC altogether. If that is regenerable ion change reason, typically it will go through some chemical regeneration process. Through that process, you do go into generate the high concentration, low volume concentrate, and then you can combine with destruction technology or also central high temperature incineration, but you are going to talk about very small volume of waste stream to deal with. And in terms of reverse osmosis reject concentrate, it really depending on the facility condition, the site setting, uh, the one I just talked about, it will be uh, just that, that diffused back into non-drinkable uh, aquifer and surface waters. So now let's switch into a different topic. Um, this is very important why we want to talk about emerging technologies. As we all learned that for those three major technologies, we mainly focus on the downstream of PFAS cycles. All right, that is trying to protect the drinking water uses. Um, so that is a uh, drinking water facility right here. We pump the groundwater through the portable well. Our technology right now, in terms of scaling up experience, pretty much is really focused on this one. But you will think about with this PFAS cycle, would that make sense? You just reduce the source. You actually start from here. So you can reduce the mass loading that flow into your drinking water supply wells. That kind of makes sense, right? So on this slide, you can see the producer and users of a um, large quantity of PFAS right here at this corner. And then you can um, a, a, and then you can have uh, some of the receivers of PFAS mass loading, including wastewater treatment plants, including landfills, including groundwater, surface water. Uh, if you do have a biosolid generated from wastewater treatment plant, it may potentially impact surface water. So it seems like it makes sense that you start thinking about how can we break down and breaking that PFAS cycles by implementing some emerging technologies. So go beyond just gag ion change reason. We know the drinking water quality uh, is much higher quality when you compare it to contaminated groundwater or comparing the biosolids and all that or then fill leachate. So if we do can come up with the right strategy and right technology, you can address the upstream PFAS cycle and lower the impact to, low, uh, to the downstream PFAS cycle. I think that is the way to go. So now it kind of start bringing into a scenario and strategy, how you actually provide a comprehensive PFAS solution. We still need that technology. They can separate PFAS efficiently in order to achieve the trace PPB levels. 
So we are not talking about emerging containment to completely replace the gag and ion change reason. However, we do have to start thinking about what if the water quality is not that good? What if we're dealing with wastewater? What if we deal, deal with uh, landfill leachates? So there are some other technology we can start thinking about. I think uh, Kent, um, as the next speaker, is going to introduce some other emerging technologies, right? So if we start thinking about we really want to break down the PFAS cycles, this is the step you have to take. You have to remove PFAS, the technology will exist and probably will be modif mod modified in the future in order to concentrate your waste stream. Once you have that concentrated waste stream, the volume come down, concentration go up, and then you can couple with destruction technology. That is what Steep is going to introduce to us today. So I'm going to quickly talk about foam fractionation. PFAS does have very unique uh, surfactant properties that we want to take advantage of. The surfactant property, you can see this slide. I know which photo actually catch your eyes. That is the beer, of course. So dishwashers, um, the dish, uh, the, uh, the detergent used for washing the dishes, the latte, the beautiful foam, and the beer, they all generate that. Um, the foam uh, based on the air water interface affect a lot to partition into the air water interface, as well as the firefighting foams. So this is nothing new to surface water and wastewater treatment plants. We all will always see the foam being generated. For the AFFF, if you do have an um, installation nearby and, and also the surface water body, there's a chance you may see the foam being generated um, at the lake short uh, surface water body. So those are kind of indicating that PFAS unique properties into the air water interface is very important. Um, so the technology that Kent and Steve are going to introduce, we'll kind of talk about that air water interface a little bit as well. So talking about the air water interface, um, it's very important. We start to see how that works, right? So you do have a PFAS with the head and tail. The tail will get into inside of the bubble. The head is going to stick out in the water phase and the bubble lift, it will be collecting on the top. So PFAS will concentrate on the air water interface. In some cases, it will generate the foam. So let's look at one scenario here where you have PFAS in water sludge and foam systems. You are going to see use PFAS, for example, PFAS is almost 100% partition into the foam. It does not even stick into the sludge or or stay in the aqueous phase. So this is where it will come from in terms of understanding how PFAS of, of can be uh, fractionated into the foams. We can convert that of uh, the air water interface into an engineering treatment solutions. Um, so the advantage of that technology potentially is you will not need to have resorbents. Uh, you will have a concentrated layers that you can remove and, and destroy, coupling with destruction technologies. So that really get rid of the, um, uh, the, the waste disposal concerns. So I'm going to go into the summary for the drinking water. We do know uh, and learn that PFOS, PFOA can be destroyed successfully to 70 parts per trillion or even lower. Um, there's no problem now. Uh, we all learn you can, if you want no, non-detect, we can actually cheat it below non-detect. But regardless how you talk about PFAS treatment, it's still a relatively young practice. So don't assume that every site is the same. Don't assume all the products behave identical. Every site is different, water quality. Once you turn out the pump, start, uh, start running the treatment system, everything go back to normal. Why you need to worry about the iron, calcium, still the same thing. So, um, so pre-designed study can help you to troubleshooting what is needed um, for the pre-treatment system. So in terms of breaking down the PFAS cycle, um, it, it does represent um, the need to reduce the upstream PFAS cycle uh, with some emerging technology that I quickly talk about the air uh, foam fractionation as an example. To break that PFAS cycle, PFAS destruction is totally critical. Um, that is why we want to focus on destruction a little bit during today's presentation. Um, and also when we talk about PFAS treatment, just be specific in terms of which PFAS we're talking about. 
uh, so we can successfully to treat and also communicate the PFAS treatment that way. So with that, um, I'm going to transition to Kent. Great. Thank you very much, Dora. That was very informative. Um, just a reminder to people to type in questions as you have them, and we're going to ask questions at the end once we finish the present presentation. So our next presenter is Dr. Kent Sorensen. He leads CDM Smith's firm-wide environmental market strategy as well as the federal environment, environment and transportation business. He is based in the Denver office and is an internationally recognized expert in the characterization and remediation of hazardous waste sites in North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. He holds six U.S. patents related to contaminated site remediation and has recently been honored by the American Society of Civil Engineers with the 2020 Henry L. Michael Award for Industry Advancement of Research. So with that, um, take it over, Kent. All right. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks, Dora. Um, I'm going to really pick it up right where Dora left off and talk about these advanced uh, separation technologies and uh, hopefully set Steve up to bring it home on destruction technology. So uh, we'll, we'll focus on what are the real opportunities and Dora touched on that. So she's she set me up nicely for that. Um, and as well as some of the, the principles for surface active foam fractionation. We'll go through a case study so you can really see that technology in action. Um, and then I'll introduce the idea of complete on-site treatment destruction of PFAS, talking about a technology, electrochemical oxidation, um, <clears throat> which is, is uh, going to be a good segue, I think, into Steve's talk um, on destruction technology. So we'll, we'll go through, like I said, limitations of conventional treatment very briefly, um, and then some details on foam fractionation in real practice and talk a little bit about the potential for closed loop treatment. All right, so as we talk about conventional technologies, Dora really touched on this, so uh, I won't have to spend a lot of time on it. We have these issues to deal with, high volumes of spent media, um, waste streams that require waste management, uh, such as backwash, for example, with GAC, uh, sometimes significant pretreatment to remove competing solutes, so if you have a dilute, you know, AFFF, for example, that has hundreds or thousands of PFAS constituents as well as other constituents in it that can overwhelm GAC or ion exchange resin. If you have high ionic strength, that's a challenge for uh, resins. So a lot of times pretreatment is going to be required for those types of streams. Um, and of course, that, that can lead to high costs for relatively small mass of contamination uh, in some cases. So Dora introduced this idea of separate, concentrate, and, and destroy for your comprehensive solution. And in that separation category, she focused on that first bullet, those first three. We also have, you know, nanofiltration is something that's that's coming along with potential. Um, and then we have these surfactants and coagulant separation, which is which is another separation technology I'll talk about today, as well as foam fractionation. Um, and uh, those last two also actually fall into the concentration category as well. So if, if we can, through coagulants or flocculation, create a concentrate, um, then, then that's going to help us on our waste management. And then again, foam fractionation does the same thing. And then finally, with those concentrates, we get down into the destruction category. And um, you know, there's a lot of research going on in this field right now for how do we destroy high concentration PFAS wastes. We've listed some technologies here. I'm gonna to touch on electrochemical. Steve's gonna talk about plasma a lot and has some, some exciting results. So uh, I think that should be pretty interesting. So let's start with surface active foam fractionation. Um, Dora gave you a, a nice introduction to how this works, but again, we're playing off of the affinity of these compounds to uh, partition into air water interfaces and then separate them as bubbles capturing the foam. So on the right hand side is a photo of our bench scale uh, foam fractionation unit in our Bellevue Washington laboratory and you can see all the bubbles coming up through the water column and then you see that nice foam at the top that we vacuum off of there and, and that's where your concentrated uh, PFAS is. 
So this concept was put into practice in full scale, I, I believe for the first time in the world in Australia with a system that went online a little over a year ago at the Oki facility. This is an Australia defense facility. Um, you know, to this point, they've treated uh, quite a bit of water uh, in 20 million liters of, of water that's been treated. And so just to give you an idea, this system is running at a continuous flow rate of 60 to 75 gallons per minute. Um, 20 million liter treated, only 500 liters of waste concentrate. So the concentration factor being achieved routinely is, is 42,000. So highly, highly concentrated. And that's that's one of the things we're very excited about with this technology now there's the potential to go much higher than that uh, but in, in full scale practice right now 42,000 is, is what's being achieved treating groundwater in in a source area that was impacted by a triple f uh, for this site the the contract treatment uh, limit was 70 parts per trillion reporting down to one part per trillion so let's let's show some of the results um, the, first of all, as you see here over on the right, uh, the, the treatment times are fairly fast. So there are uh, primary fractionators, secondary fractionators, we'll get into that in a second here. But uh, three to four minutes for PFOS and PFOA in primary fractionation to get the results that we're gonna talk through uh, as you get to the shorter chain compounds like PFHXS, uh, you're, you're at 10 to 12 minutes. So that's your six chain, six carbon chain. Uh, compound and those were the three that are being regulated uh, by the Australian government at this Oki plant. Um, so the the rates again are shown there um, but you can see PFOS is the highest concentration uh, coming from this AFFF source area and uh, you see rapid reduction in concentrations. PFO is much lower but also good reductions. Um, so you know very nice results there. This is the breakdown when you really look at the numbers. So uh, it might take a second for you to kind of figure out what we're looking at here in this chart. So on the left side of this ribbon chart um, is, is the total mass of PFAS compounds that were being analyzed. And you see the data over there on the right. So the big ones, of course, PFOS and PFOA, um, you know, have fairly high concentrations, uh, the, the six, chain compounds also reasonably high concentrations at this site um, and with just primary fractionation um, you're seeing reductions um, down from you know above two milligrams per liter to less than two or less than three um, parts per trillion for PFOS and PFOA so you know tremendous results there um, and then it's pretty good removal too, getting down to 20 parts per trillion for PFHXS. Uh, so that's pretty pretty exciting as well. Um, and then uh, because of all the uh, the compounds there, there is a, a ion exchange polishing on this system, um, and then that takes everything down to to very low levels at the very end. But 81.7% of the bulk PFAS from AFFF is removed by foam fractionation and the, the three regulated compounds are below the discharge standards again with just foam fractionation without the polishing let's see my screen is locked up here there we go okay so let's talk about the concentration factors now um, so this little flow chart is just intended to kind of illustrate um, how these concentration factors are achieved. So if we take a million liters from the left of contaminated feed water, and you, you can see the initial concentrations of PFOS and, and total uh, PFAS, um, you know, there, there's a, a minimal amount of pretreatment. Actually, there's very little at the Oki plant, um, basically some filtration. Um, we go into the primary fractionation step and uh, we get a, a 10 times concentration factor. So we have a million liters comes in. Um, uh -huh. Oh, did we lose Kent? I 
other presenters? Um, I don't hear Kent. This is Chuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kent? Oh, goodness. We're all having trouble today. <laughs> Let's say that he's talking, but we're not hearing him. Um, hmm. Dora, can you give him a quick call? Or you want to? I apologize to everybody. Uh, we were, it was fascinating and learning a lot here, and we seem to have lost Kent. <clears throat> he might be having similar troubles to what I did. Uh, should we switch over to Steve? Steve? Mm -hmm. We could do that temporarily. Uh, mm -hmm. Happy to Steve, do it. are you ready to go? I am. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, now that Kent has the control, let me see if I can do it now. <laughs> see okay. if my computer's working. This is Jennifer at Namoa. Oh, goodness. Sorry, everybody. My haven't had any technical difficulties yet, but uh, this is the first one. So, oh, Steve, you're, you've are you got two you're in here twice. Uh-oh. Yeah, I'm not sure how that, that happened. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna I don't keep know which talking. one is you. I, I think the one, if I'm talking right now, that'll be the one. We can hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they both say the same thing. Um, I'm going to give it to this one and see if that works. Okay. Hang on, sorry, everybody. Okay, there. Uh, this is Dora. Apparently, he cannot hear, um, we cannot hear him, he is still there. So what I try to do, oh, okay. Steve, you want to go ahead? Uh, well, yeah, we, I were, can go. we were just temporarily gonna do that um, okay. so that we can get through this. Uh, content here. I do have questions that came in, particularly for um, Kent's presentation as well. So hopefully he can get back. Um, but I think we'll move on uh, in the interest of time, everybody. Sorry about this. Um, so our next presenter uh, is going to talk more about um, the construction part. Dr. Stephen Richardson is the Vice President and Principal Engineer with GSI Environmental. Uh, but he's in their Austin, Texas office. Steve, Steve specializes in the application of innovative strategies to treat conventional and emerging contaminants in soil, groundwater, and surface water at a wide range of contaminated sites. He has served as principal investigator on several DOD-sponsored research projects on co-metabolic degradation of 1,4-dioxane, innovative approaches for treatment of chlorinated solvents in low permeability zones, anaerobic bioremediation of bee napple, and of course, today's topic, treatment of PFAS. So Steve is also a licensed professional engineer in Texas, Louisiana, North Carolina, and Alberta, Canada. So with that, take it away, Steve. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Uh, and um, I will try and get through this so we can get back to Kent and make sure there's time for you guys to ask some questions uh, to him uh, as well. Before I begin, I'd, I'd like to uh, acknowledge co-authors here, Poonam Kalkarni, who works out of the uh, Houston office at GSI, and then uh, co-authors uh, Selma Mendetovich and Tom Holson at Clarkson University. And again, the, the title of this talk is An Enhanced Contact Electrical Discharge Plasma Reactor. Try and say that uh, three times fast. Uh, this is a technology that we've been working on through some funding from the Air Force, as well as ESTCP, um, to develop a mobile treatment trailer, which you see in the in this picture right here, and we were able to test it at uh, at a, a fire training area uh, at a DoD site, and I'll show you some uh, results uh, from that. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Okay, so just uh, again, Dora has gone through this, and as well as as Kent, there's a there's a ton of options that we have in terms of. Uh, ex situ uh, treatment. The focus at this point has mainly been on sorption, uh, you know, as, as Dora had mentioned, uh, granular activated carbon, ion exchange, and others. 
in terms of the in situ world, you know, they're generally unproven, fairly limited, uh, you know, bioremediation, carbon injection, um, heat activated per sulfate. There's been some talk about all these things, but again, this is in such, uh, it's such infancy at this point. And again, with that carbon and fluorine bond being so strong, uh, a lot of these in situ applications are difficult to execute. So right now, the focus has been heavily on these ex situ options. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss uh, one of those destructive technologies, that's plasma. And hopefully, we can get a chance to hear some of the results from uh, uh, Kent on electrochemical as well. So I'm going to jump right into it. This is, a, again, an Air Force um, a funded research project and the goal again was to, uh, to to develop this plasma technology that at that point had only been demonstrated in the lab and to go ahead and demonstrate that in the field and so to actually implement an on-site PFAS remediation technology and as uh, most of us know or all of us know is that you know the DOD uh, were, were big users of uh, AFFF part of their fire training activities and so it's no surprise that uh, a lot of the active PFAS investigations that are occurring uh, are focused on these Air Force bases, on the Navy bases, Army bases, and installations, and so on. And when you do these assessments, you're generating a large amount of investigation-derived waste or, or essentially purge water when you're purging a lot of these monitoring wells. And so, uh, again, the Air Force problem is fairly large. We're dealing with uh, this number is even higher now, greater than 400 former fire training areas. Uh, many of which are, again, currently assessing the extent of PFAS impacts. Uh, disposal of PFAS impacted water is very costly at this point. Uh, a lot of that water is being incinerated uh, at several dollars per gallon. Uh, and so that's, you know, that can add up very, very quickly. Also a risk of uh, significant long-term liability associated with that. Um, and then the purge water contains a variety, a variety of co-contaminants that also require treatment. And so the Air Force, as well as others, are looking for innovative, cost-effective technologies to treat not only just the stored water, but also PFAS-impacted groundwater, surface water, and, and other uh, types of uh, PFAS sources. So this is where we jump in, and I'll talk a little bit about the plasma-based uh, water treatment. And in a nutshell, what plasma-based uh, treatment relies on is electricity. So you use the power that's generated in electricity to convert water into a mixture of highly reactive species. And that's what is plasma. And these species will rapidly and non-selectively degrade uh, a, a whole host of recalcitrant uh, compounds uh, and are capable of breaking that uh, carbon and fluorine bond that we were talking about. Electrical discharge plasma is formed directly in or above the water surface. So again, we have put a lot of focus in on this air-water interface and, and uh, no different, this plasma technology that I'm gonna present today, again, relies on that air-water interface as a, as a means for treatment for PFAS. And what it does is it makes use of these uh, uh, hydroxyl radicals to oxidize. It makes use of these uh, very powerful aqueous electrons to chemically reduce these, uh, these compounds. Benefits, uh, again, whole host of reactive species that can be generated by plasma, uh, capable of treating a wide variety of compounds, not only uh, PFAS, but VOCs, as well as 1,4-dioxane uh, and others. And uh, the plasma process requires no chemical addition uh, and produces no residual waste uh, that you might see from either ion exchange, for example, or granule activated carbon. So how does uh, plasma work? Well, essentially in the in the prototype that we're we're working on at Clarkson University, it it takes as as I'd mentioned before, it takes advantage of the PFAS properties. And so we have these high voltage electrodes that are gener that are used for generating plasma. And that those are positioned at the top of the water surface. We have these stainless steel strips as ground electrons that are underneath. And then this is the part that really matters: is this there's gas diffusion or diffusers, excuse me, along the bottom of the reactors that create these bubbles. And so this is argon gas that's being bubbled through the reactor. This is a closed reactor in the top. There's an in and there's an, there's an influent and there's an effluent. Uh, so it moves from uh, one side to the other. And that gas pushes those PFAS up to the surface where they can interact with uh, the, uh, the, the plasma stringers is what they're called. So high voltage is applied uh, between the suspended electrodes and those grounded electrodes to create those lightning bolts that uh, I'll show you in a second. And then the mechanism for PFAS destruction, as I had just alluded to, 
is that again, the key here is that that argon gas is being continuously pumped from the base of the reactor up through about a inch or two of water. And then it's pumped, it's pumped upwards and essentially uh, drives the PFAS to that water surface where it can come in contact with the, um, with the plasma uh, the stringers. Uh, and so the dissolved uh, reactive species are generated by the plasma that drive that reaction uh, within the water column. And so on the right-hand side, you'll see this figure here again, greater than 98% of the PFOA uh, it will, will interface or will protrude out of that interface. And so it's very fairly easy, a lot like the, um, the results that Dora was showing, fairly easy to deal with the long chain compounds, uh, a little more difficult to deal with the short chain as I'll show um, some results in a second. So this is a picture of the plasma uh, reactor setup. Uh, again, uh, it's all housed in a stainless steel box that is grounded. Uh, this is not only for safety, but also as an electromagnetic interference. It allows for protection of, of, uh, of any of the instrumentation that's outside. So the whole plasma unit ge does generate some minor amounts of EMI, which is then contained within this box. At the top is uh, two rotating uh, spark gaps. So you can see my, uh, my uh, cursor here. At uh, the top, that's where the discharge, that's where the power is generated, runs through the capacitor bank, and then down through the plasma reactor one, which is right here, and then the trade system plasma reactor two. And we can create several of these. This modular system is what makes it very easy to just create duplicate uh, reactors and run them in parallel, run them in series, however you want to run them. Um, so there's some versatility associated with this technology. So the project objectives were, as I mentioned, to really take this technology from the lab scale, move it into something that's more of a pilot scale in the center here. And you can see these are the prototypes that were developed. And then finally into a trailer where we're actually testing it at a, um, at a field site. Before we were out in the field, we actually did some laboratory testing. And this is a, a, a recent paper that we put together. It was published in ES&T uh, last year. And this was uh, several samples from uh, Air Force bases and you can see the different types of water that were types of, of visuals that you can see here in types of water, different turbidities that we're dealing with, as well as different TDS, uh, different water quality overall. Um, none of the water that was treated was pre-treated, it was just run simply through the reactor. And these are the results that we got. This is the y-axis here. This is a log scale concentration of PFOA plus PFOS. And again, as we'd mentioned, we're trying to achieve a goal of 70 nanograms per liter. So a variety of different concentrations here uh, for PFOA, PFOS that we were dealing with, starting concentrations. But by and large, we were able to achieve uh, 70 nanograms per liter within a minute, uh, even less in some cases, but generally between one to two minutes uh, down to um, 70 PPT. Another uh, sort of anecdotal evidence of treatment here, and we'd mentioned this with the foam fractionation, is that if you took a, and these should be actually flipped, my apologies, untreated sample is foaming treated sample, not so much. And so what we noticed was after we treated these samples, the foam uh, actually went away, which would make sense. That sort of backs up the evidence that the PFAS had been destroyed. For the field uh, demonstration, uh, we designed a mobile unit uh, for treatment of PFAS impacted groundwater, uh, stored IDW purge water and other uh, sources. It has two plasma reactors, uh, each uh, containing a, a housing about a uh, one to two gallons of water. So a fairly small system at this point. We've already moved the system up to, uh, to handle closer to eight gallons per minute. Right now, this was operating at about a gallon to two gallons a minute. Um, and we were accommodating different reaction reactor conditions. Uh, we changed flow rate, we changed argon's recirculation rate, we changed the number of recycles through the system. Um, and so we were able to do that all on the field, um, a field uh, uh, out in the field. Uh, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, water samples were collected before and after each reactor, and as I mentioned, we had uh, monitored flow rates, pressures, voltage, energy use, and also the number of recycling units. Here's a quick uh, bird's eye view of the trailer. We had this trailer divided into two sections, a plasma side of the trailer, so the hot side, so to speak, with the plasma reactors here uh, at one, and then a sort of cold side or a side where we were taking samples um, and monitoring performance on this side that allowed us, we had two mixing influent and effluent tanks, again, to make sure we were getting representative samples that were going in and out of the system. 
here's a quick picture of what the sample side collection of the trailer looked like with the influent and affluent tanks, as well as the rotameters, all the instrumentation associated with it. And then this is the plasma side of the trailer. Again, uh, the, the plasma units were lifted up. Again, uh, the effluent was gravity drained. So that's why we have the systems higher up. Um, but again, this whole system could be modular. We could add several different um, uh, units here uh, to create, increase the capacity of our treatment trailer. And then the most important thing, of course, we've got the uh, broom. That's the most important part to keep the system clean. <laughs> uh, so let's jump into preliminary results. Um, so the, the goal of, the, system, of the, uh, the field demonstration was, again, we were testing a lot of different operational conditions. We're also testing the blind because these samples are being taken, submitted to Clarkson University, and we don't get the results back for another 24 hours. So a lot of the design was done pre-operation and then optimized as we went through. We treated about 350 gallons. It was actually a little bit more than that. We operated a variety of different flow rates ranging from 0.3 to 1, 1 gallons per minute in each of those reactors. And then we chose up to 10 recycling events. Again, that was not necessary for the majority of, of long chain and a majority of short chain compounds. Um, and so a lot of the treatment could have been done a lot quicker. Um, significant removal of PFO, PFOS, and other long chain PFASs within uh, uh, one to two cycles. So you can see the concentrations here on this top uh, time series graph. Uh, PFO or PFOS dropped off uh, very quickly within the first cycle. So really just a flow through system would have worked just quite well here to achieve uh, 70 PPT. Similar results for precursors, which I haven't shown. Again, very quick removal or transformation of those pre precursors. And then what you end up seeing is longer removal times, three to six cycles for some of the short chain PFAS were required. And you'll notice there's just one here that just keeps causing problems. I think the same sort of issues, some of the other technologies that are out there is that PFBA is very difficult to deal with. It's a short chain compound, very difficult to get that to that air water interface. So one of the things that we're focusing on at Clarkson, I know others are, are sort of looking at the same idea, is seeding a treatment system with another surfactant to try and push that PFBA and those shorter chain PFAS up to the interface where they can be broken apart by a plasma or perhaps another type of technology. So let's just jump in. I know this won't work perfectly, but this is a video of the, the plasma reactor, uh, but you'll get the idea. I'm going to press go here. And as Chuck Newell says, this is sort of one of the most even more perfect technologies. It, it, it's got lots of bright lights and it makes this really crazy sound like, you know, so, so in terms of, you know, sound and in terms of visuals, it's got it all. And so if we move on to the final thing, take home messages. Again, uh, plasma-based water treatment is an effective uh, treatment technology. We're, we're, you know, we're really excited about the results that we're seeing so far. We have some additional funding that we received from ESTCP uh, and some other uh, funding sources to look at different types of water, AFFF rinsate, uh, some uh, other PFAS groundwater, some surface waters. It's uh, relatively cost-effective uh, compared to, to, to current treatment technology and disposal methods. Again, we're working on those numbers right now, trying to really narrow down, but most certainly way cheaper than an incineration and certainly uh, a lot cheaper than what we're dealing with in terms of uh, 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 GAC, in terms of the uh, replacement of that uh, media over and over again. Again, we're a very small scale at this point, only a gallon or two gallons per minute, but we are working the system up to be upscaled to larger, um, larger systems. Capable of treating a wide variety of compounds, requires no chemical additions and no residual waste, um, and then the co-contaminants overall had no effect on treatment uh, efficiency. Uh, so we were able to degrade some VOCs. We were able to, uh, the, some of the metals just simply went through the system. There was no change to those. They had no impact on treatment um, effectiveness overall. And we're, we're learning that this treatment technology is highly scalable and it can be integrated into a whole bunch of different ways. Like right now, this was the primary treatment. It was solely used to treat the water, uh, which was pumped from a, a couple of groundwater wells. Uh, but as Dora and, and Kent mentioned, you know, the idea of concentrating uh, PFAS contaminated water into something smaller is a very attractive way to do things. And then using that smaller volume of water uh, to, to uh, the plasma to treat that smaller volume of water makes a ton of sense. And so the idea of this being at the end of a treatment train is a very attractive option. 
So this is the uh, this is the final slide here, and hopefully there's some time for Kent as well. Wanted to thank CERTIP, ESTCP, U.S. Air Force for their uh, their their funding and their support. And then uh, if anyone's interested, has some more questions about the technology, these are our uh, contact information. So thanks so much. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. That was great. And we do have Kent back, uh, hopefully. So I am going to turn it back over to him uh, to finish up, hopefully in five minutes. Then we'll do a few questions. And then if folks can actually stay on a little past three, uh, maybe we can try to work through uh, more of the questions. So um, I will turn it over to Kent. And let's see if that works. And can you hear me now, Jennifer? Yes, we can hear you. Now we just need to see Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay, so um, hopefully quick, five minutes or less. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so we'll go pretty fast through the last couple of things here. Um, and so uh, actually, Steve, I appreciate where you finished up because uh, we, were, we were talking about concentration factors here and creating a much lower volume waste stream to deal with. And so really the bottom line on this slide is when you use primary and secondary fractionation, um, you know, you're, you're getting down to only 10 liters of concentrated PFAS waste out of a million uh, that require destruction. And then you can even use a tertiary fractionation step to get that down even further. But with the, the concentration factors that are being realized uh, in the field at the Oki plant by OPEC Systems currently, uh, just to give you a visual image of what we're talking about, that's basically taking an Olympic sized swimming pool full of water down to a teacup. So that's, that's the degree of concentration that uh, this technology appears to be able to achieve. So, um, you know, that's, that's obviously pretty, exciting. So what that introduces is the possibility of closed loop treatment. So now that you have this really small volume of highly concentrated PFAS, things like plasma and electrochemical oxidation become a lot more plausible and economically feasible um, because they, they work great on low volumes of highly concentrated liquids. And so this is an example for electrochemical oxidation uh, on on the SAF hyperconcentrate. So this is actually using that highly concentrated PFAS from the Oki treatment plant. So OPEC Systems gave us a sample to test electrochemical oxidation in our lab. Um, and what you see on the right hand side is is two to three order of magnitude um, decreases in concentration. And exactly like Steve showed with plasma, you see those red triangles. PFBA is that kind of problem child that that takes a little longer. And you know, I think with more specific charge or more time, um, you you can see that go down further. And we're we're actively working toward that. But you know, aside from that one, which is actually generated and then slowly degraded, uh, we see you know very promising results there. On the left hand side, you're seeing the fluorine mass balance. So when that gets up to one, that means we've, we've got a good mass balance in our analytical and we're accounting for all of the PFAS compounds. So with, with something like that, electrochemical oxidation or uh, you know plasma, you could put plasma in my green circle over here where it says eco, um, you can potentially take that small volume of highly concentrated waste, destroy you know, 90%, 99%, 99.9% of the PFAS in that highly concentrated waste and then just recycle uh, the effluent from that back to primary fractionation and run this whole thing in a closed loop. So that possibility is something that, you know, I think is pretty exciting about that technology. Um, now I'm gonna move to the last thing here since we only have a couple of minutes. Uh, and this is the idea of, of perfluorad. So um, there, there are other applications um, that are still really challenging. And one of those is if you have a foam-based system um, and you're changing out your, your AFFF, for example, to a fluorine-free foam, and or you're decontaminating anything that had AFFF in it, it's very hard to clean those, um, those process systems. Triple water rinsing doesn't work. It leaves a lot of uh, PFAS in there. Uh, solvents, detergents, things like that. A lot of things have been tried without a lot of success. Um, 
And so, you know, something, and then, and then you have the wastewater that comes out of that is, is very high in PFAS concentrations, which makes GAC and ion exchange, you know, relatively inefficient for reasons that we talked about earlier. So what, what do we do about that? There's a really interesting uh, compound called perfluorad developed in Germany uh, a few years back. It's biodegradable. It's developed uh, from plant-based fatty acids. Uh, it's a liquid, density similar to water. It's not flammable, um, you know, relatively low viscosity. And what it is is a cationic molecule that can then interact with our anionic PFAS molecules uh, to potentially bind with those and form a larger flock that can then be separated um, preferentially for, as far as the anionic molecules go. So uh, in Germany, a company called Cornelson developed and, and patented this. And, uh, you know, we got interested in it and decided to say, you know, let, let's look at this with three different water types, a diluted AFFF, an AFFF impacted groundwater, and a landfill leachate. And let's look at how perfluorad performs relative to um, ion exchange resin, for example. So the dilute AFFF is, is a pretty challenging matrix because it's very high concentration in PFAS. There's lots of competitive inhibition possibilities and so forth. So we looked at that and we found that over on the right here, starting with pretty high concentrations of PFAS and PFOA, um, we get great removal of, of both of those, both over 90%, uh, I think over 95, over 99 in, in one case. Um, and anti-exchange resin over on the right, you see statistically zero removal compared to what perfluorad was able to do. Um, and by the way, we do add ferric iron at about 150 milligrams per liter uh, to help with the, the flocculation coagulation. So, um, so, you know, that was pretty exciting. And uh, we also compared that to, well, well, what if you had, you know, what if you used any other commercially available surfactant? So you see here in, in our lab, we tried uh, six different uh, compounds, including perfluorad, and none of them were even close. I, I, I was actually surprised by this. None of them were really close. Perfluorad really does do a nice job um, of, you know, pretty selectively going after PFOS and PFOA. And so it does seem to be viable. Uh, iron chloride improves the efficiency. Um, it, it did work for um, landfill leachate and contaminated groundwater as well. Um, the sulfonates in the, in the um, landfill leachate, it had a little more trouble with compared to everything else. Um, but, it, you know, it really seems like it could be used either as a standalone treatment in some cases or, or certainly as a pretreatment to protect uh, granular activated carbon or resin. Um, it does also, like this other technology, provide a concentrated PFAS uh, waste stream, again, that perhaps plasma or electrochemical oxidation could be used to treat and get destruction on site. So. The potential applications that we've looked at are the ones I've mentioned, treating contaminated groundwater, pretreatment for GAC RI exchange resin, or <clears throat> this treatment of wash water, decon water during AFFF replacement. And I wanted to highlight that one because that's being used in Germany right now to tr uh, clean out fire trucks that uh, are, are going from uh, AFFF to fluorine-free foams. And so perfluorad is, is flushed through the fire truck, and then the uh, water is treated over here on the right, again, using perfluorad. Um, and it, the solution, the effluent of that goes through filters over here and then through a small GAC column before being discharged. So you have a little bit of GAC, but your GAC usage is tiny compared to what it would be if you had to treat it without the perfluorad. And so, any, you know, anytime you, you have a truck like this that you're trying to clean out, mixing is a big deal. So I'll show you the, the German solution to that. Um, whoops, maybe I won't show you that. Um, oh, here we go. Um, what you do is you stand on the truck and you, you shake it. You got to really do some shaking and shimmying here to get good mixing. So um, that's, that's how you do it right there in case you were wondering. Um, you can also drive the truck around, but I, I like the shaking a little bit better for video purposes. Um, so then there's a recent study here just published. This will be my, my last slide. 
um, in Germany where independently, um, this is a fire protection periodical and they use perfluorad in, in a fire truck and then they looked at six different components, or sorry, five different components of that process system and the effectiveness of perfluorad to clean those out and they got uh, greater than two order of magnitude reduction of PFAS compounds and all five of those system components. Um, so, so really great results there. And, and so consequently, um, we've got some funding from ESTCP to do that for the US DOD to evaluate uh, whether this approach will work to clean out firefighting vehicles and, and potentially any really AFFF uh, system where you're doing a foam clean out. So um, that'll be happening this year. And that concludes my presentation. Excellent. Well, thank you, Kent. And um, I'm glad we were able to get through all of the content. Um, and sorry about losing some time in the beginning and in the middle with the technical difficulties, everybody. Um, I will rapid fire a few of these questions. If folks can stay on a little bit longer, um, we can try to work through them um, because there are several. Uh, but here's one quick, I think, for um, Kent, foam frac fractionation. What is the lowest PFAS concentration this has been demonstrated for? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, you know, down to, you know, part per billion levels for sure. The, the lower the concentration gets, the, the less that water is going to want to foam as, as we put a lot of air through it. Um, so uh, the, the Oki site, I want to say it was under a part per billion. Um, you know, over part per million, it, it, it definitely works. Um, but there, there are some things. There's an SDBS uh, surfactant, or, for example, that can also be added um, that is removed by the foam fractionation process. You don't have to worry about it in the waste stream uh, to help with the foaming. And in our lab studies, we're seeing that that's, that's very effective. Um, haven't had to use it in the field yet, um, but we are looking at some field applications in, in situ even, believe it or not, um, where it might be helpful to add something like that at the lower concentrations like you would have in a, in a low concentration groundwater site, for example. Um, so I, I can't give a definitive answer because we haven't really <laughs> um, you know, found out what the lower limit is. Uh, but but that's that's kind of where we are. Okay, great. Um, I'm not sure exactly who this one's for. Uh, probably all of you could answer this one. But um, with separation technologies for drinking water, such as GAC, granule activated carbon, and anti anion exchange resin, um, are the competitive effects of inorganic anions such as chlorine and HCO3 and other common chemical species thought to be important. Um, I can <laughs> I can take a lead. Um, yeah, um, definitely those anion will be competing effects. Um, should be definitely considered as an important factor. That is why you do have to consider some um, bench scale level or pilot scale level uh, um, testing before you scale up for the full scale um, design as well as construction. And we, in one case that we're testing the ion change reason that I show one of the slide, not uh, the reason one has a poor um, performance comparing to reason two. Um, the reason one was not designed for PFAS, but once we remove um, the chlorine concentration in that water, it actually performed very similar to reason two. So it, it kind of is showing us that um, the chloride definitely has some strong effect. Okay, uh, I think this one is for Steve. Um, what is the recommended temperature and gas residence time for efficient DRE? Sorry, I didn't catch that for efficient. DRE? Just, I don't know exactly what DRE is. I was hoping it's jargon that you knew. <laughs> I, I don't. Um, Kent or Dora, do you guys know what DRE is? It's a destruction efficiency, I believe. Okay. All right. Like how many nines, basically? Right. Okay. That sounds good. Thank you. So, uh, and, and it was gas recirculate. So the gas is its closed system. So we use just an as a simple argon tank, 
uh, that is then res uh, recirculated through um, through the system. Uh, for just to give you an idea, for the field uh, event, which lasted a couple of weeks, we used very little uh, argon out of that out of the tank. It was just a, a you know, standard lab tank that you would get. Um, and then the first part of the question, Jennifer, what was the, it was the gas recirculation. Temperature and, then was, and residence temperature. time. So the temperature doesn't, the temperature, because it's a flow through system, and this is uh, actually low temperature plasma, so it's not hot plasma by any means, the temperature of the water doesn't change. Uh, it's very, very limited change. If it were in batch, it would increase slightly, but not a whole lot. Um, and then in terms of uh, resonance time, it's very quick. Um, again, we're putting, um, we, we had been recycling that water through the system in the field, uh, but it's only a matter of a minute or two going through that, that reactor um, for the long chain. For short chain, again, we're recycling and, and running that system through. So again, the resonance time would obviously increase overall. Um, but yes, yeah, so to, to as we move towards commercializing or gain this this technology into higher uh, fl uh, throughputs, um, the the idea will be to reduce the number of recycle times, if at all, uh, or uh, at all, and then um, you know, make it take advantage of a the a fastest uh, resonance time that we possibly can, which in this case probably in the order of minutes running through that reactor. Okay. Uh, there's quite a few other ones that have jargon in them as well. So hopefully people will know what it is. What is the EEO for the plasma treatment ah. for the various compounds? The EEO, I'll have to look that up. Um, and so if maybe Jennifer, if you could ask another question, I can look it up. I actually have that number. It can take me a second to do it. Maybe ask another question. I can get back. Okay, they a lot of them are for you, but um, oh, I okay. will. Uh, no, I'll ask a general one. So, with the carbon sure. granulator activated carbon, how often or how frequent is the arsenic issue, and is it something people should worry about actually for non PFAS oriented uses? Uh, I, I can I can I can answer that one first, and then um, the other presenter can chime in. The arsenic issue that we run into, I have to say, is not specific for PFAS. Uh, from what I heard, is actually originated from the carbon itself. Um, during during manufacturing those activated carbon, it comes with it. Um, so it always, now we kind of start thinking about it may be good once again, when you do some bin scale or pilot testing, you, you may need to have some pre-wash step to remove those arsenic. Um, a lot of time when we design a banjo pilot study, you forgot to monitor all those, the other non-PFAS parameters. And with the time goes, we realize that is actually very critical. Like I say, once you have your system installed and started operating, it's just like another gag treatment system. So you need to pay attention uh, anything beyond just, just PFAS. An arsenic, you can probably see that leaching out from the gag for a period of time. You do need to have some kind of mitigation measure in order to address that. They probably not expect it. But once again, if you do have a comprehensive bench skill study, you should be able to identify that issue and also communicate with the vendor. Make sure when you receive that gag, um, it will not potentially leach out the arsenic. Okay. Um, there's a couple questions uh, yeah. related to Jennifer, plasma can, again. Oh, go ahead. I can answer the EEO question. Um, the EEO for the field demonstration was less than 10 kilowatt hours per meter cubed. And we've actually in the lab got closer to the lower end was closer to two kilowatt hours per meter cubed. And what's EEO? What's Say that again. For? What oh, is electric, the EEO? electric energy per order. So it's a parameter that sort of measures the energy uh, to degrade um, a contaminant by an order of magnitude in a unit volume. So it's just a standard measure that we can use to compare technologies at least closer to apples to apples. Okay. Uh, here's another. There's several questions actually related to plasma treatment about what are the end products? that you come out of the system with and what happens to those? What are the, is the residual waste and what's it, what do you do with it or what are the end products and their toxicity? 
uh, the, the end products are no different than any other destructive technology. We're trying to break down the carbon uh, and fluorine chains. Uh, and so what you do end up is an increase in, in fluorine and that you, you'll see that. Um, and there's also some, <clears throat> there's some gases that are actually produced, but we recycle that through the headspace. Uh, and so that is a continually treated uh, during operation. So in terms of the, the uh, byproducts, it really would be no different than any other destructive technology. It's going to be short chain uh, PFAS, uh, potentially. If you have precursors, high levels of precursors in the influent water, you're going to generate some of these short chains through the plasma technology. But again, that's the importance of recycling it through is that you at the beginning will generate some of these shorter chains. And if you can increase that residence time, as we were talking about before, uh, you can actually then start to break down those shorter chains, uh, pr uh, provided you can get those compounds to that water surface. Um, again, that was that's as we mentioned, PFBA is a problematic uh, compound, being uh, fairly short chain and, and difficult to get to the surface. Um, and again, there's some options there to improve that that Kent mentioned and I mentioned before. Okay. Um, how about the power source? for um, plasma and how much yeah. power? The power source was just an offsite generator, uh, just an industrial size generator um, that, you know, diesel, diesel run. Um, but the plasma trailer is operated, can be plugged into, it's basically a dry, dryer outlet. Um, so it's a, what is that, a 240? Um, so it's, Basically, we designed it in a way that if we were near a warehouse or near a, a power source, we could plug in directly into um, like a warehouse setting. If it's out in the middle of a field, which often it is, or there's no infrastructure, power infrastructure around, um, then we can use an external generator to, to do that. Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Um, is there any occupational safety concerns with plasma? Is it generating any x-rays or any sort of high frequency systems or? Yeah, it does. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's some electromagnetic interference. Again, the, the cage that it's built into uh, is essentially a Faraday cage. That's what that, um, that box is that we built. Uh, again, those EMIs are fairly minor. Um, uh, and, and so we, Notice very little, even when we operated the system with uh, the, the um, doors open, because you can tell immediately if there's EMI interference because your laptops don't work and your, your cell phones will stop working. There's like a little bit of interference. Um, but generally, it's pretty minor. You have to get very, very close to the units to do that. Uh, it is high voltage, I'm not going to lie. So it is a dangerous uh, system. Um, obviously, operating with the doors open is only done by uh, experts, it needs to be closed and sealed off uh, before operating. Um, there, there are also grounding rods that are installed as part of the trailer. Uh, excess energy is put into the ground, uh, so there are some concerns about cordoning off areas and making sure that uh, that people are safe. But yes, you are playing with electricity uh, and high voltage electricity, so there are always going to be safety concerns uh, that need to be taken into account in any sort of uh, operational setting. All right, we'll just do one or two more and we'll end in just a couple minutes here. So um, at 3.15, and I thank everybody for sticking on. Um, how about um, people are wondering about landfill leachate and the potential for treatment or destruction, you know, being able to put a, a, put a uh, media such as that that's got a whole bunch of different stuff in it and might be somewhat concentrated in destruction. I, I can take the first shot at that one, Jennifer. This is Kent. Um, okay. So landfill, landfill leachate is, it, it is a challenging matrix. And, you know, the question came up earlier about, you know, our, our natural anions and things like that, a challenge for, you know, the conventional treatment processes. And, and Dora rightly said, yes, they are. Well, landfill leachate kind of takes that and, you know, kicks it up a notch because you have a lot you you often have a higher ionic strength than a landfill leachate, and particularly for resins, that's very problematic. But it's also problematic for GAC because landfill leachate tends to have a lot of organic carbon in it too. So, um, you, you know, you 
you get less efficient with a lot of your conventional technologies. And, and that's part of why we, we got interested in perfluorate actually for landfill leachate. Um, and again, we, we got good results for uh, the carboxylic acid PFAS compounds, um, a little less so for the sulfonates. Um, but, you know, decent results overall, I would say, um, but, you know, definitely something that uh, could be optimized. Um, and we we are, you know, I guess cautiously optimistic about foam fractionation um, for landfill leachate. And then again, you, you would still want to combine that ideally with one of the destruction technologies we've been talking about. Um, but the, the things that make that matrix difficult for a lot of technologies uh, are either neutral or might even help foam fractionation because higher ionic strength actually you know, not only hurts it, it, it may even help foam fractionation. So, um, you know, that's that's one that definitely is showing some promise. And, and we're starting um, now doing some treatability studies with landfill leachate with foam fractionation. So I think there's there's potential there for sure, um, but, but work to be done. All right, great. Well, I'm going to uh, just, oh, is there something else? Okay, so I think we're just about at 315. Um, I will be posting, here's the NAMOA website, people want to know more about NAMOA. Um, I will be posting the presentations. Here's uh, where they think go, waste site cleanup area, then you go to events, and then uh, we've got a few events coming up, but also one more of these PFAS webinars. Hopefully a lot of you are already registered for uh, this last one on July 29th. Uh, PFAS and groundwater investigation results in New Hampshire and considering soil leaching. I really want to thank uh, the presenters today. I will be posting their uh, presentations, PDFs, uh, at the uh, website for this event. This will get uh, redone to have their um, presentations posted here, and I will send a email out to everybody that attended um, with that information. So I really want to thank uh, Dr. Newell, Dr. Chang, Dr. Sorensen, and Dr. Richardson for their presentations today, and we'll try to get them back for an update um, in the future. So thank you, everybody, and um, sorry for all the technical difficulties at the beginning. Um, <laughs> anything else? All right, I think we got through most of the questions, and thank you. I'm going to end the webinar now. Everybody have a nice rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.